Man, it's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. I love it. Uh, I love to hear the, the songs of worship and uh, just hearing our people sing. It's just such a powerful thing. You know, I hope you uh, sometimes, you know, it's, we're all supposed to participate, but sometimes it's cool just to stop and listen. And everybody can't do it at the same time because nobody be singing. But to sit there and just listen to God's people singing uh, is, is a blessing, you know, and God says he uses it as part of his witness or our witness uh, to the people around us. And so anyway, it's pretty cool just to be able to experience that. And uh, for many of you guys that are watching online, I know you, you don't get to experience that completely like we do, but I want to say this to our online crowd. If you guys would give them a warm welcome one more time. Pretty cool uh, deal last week. You know, we never know who all is watching or where they're watching from. We just know it comes from all over the world. And anyway, last Sunday, there were three people that put their faith in Christ for salvation from online. And, uh, and so that's good stuff. So celebrating you guys uh, wherever you are. And, uh, and so God is at work around us, right? Don't you love that? He, uh, that he allows us to be a part of things. And uh, he trusts us to do his ministry. He trusts us with his mission. And, uh, and so we, we, we love the fact that God trusts us in that way. And uh, today we're, we're going to be looking at contagious generosity and, uh, you know, we're, we're preparing really, uh, I don't know if you guys noticed, but there's a few improvements around. We uh, put some paint on the walls and we changed some things up around, just kind of getting ready for Easter. You know, it's kind of like whenever you got guests coming, you know, your mama, whatever, makes you clean up a little bit more, right? And uh, you see things and you realize things that need to be done. And so we know that you guys are going to be in, inviting guests. We know that, right? I know that. I know you're going to do that. And I'm, pr I'm believing that, right? And so we're preparing for our guests that are going to be here Easter weekend and there's like I said I want to encourage you to you know to tell them hey listen man you can come go with me I'll come by and pick you up you know I'll meet you there whatever it takes but I want you to reach out to those that do not have a church home that that, that maybe man we don't know where they are spiritually but we care enough to care about where they are spiritually and so I want to just challenge you man just to be thinking about who God who do you want me to bring who do you want me to go after and don't let it be just one person be as many as God puts on your mind go after them because that's what we're supposed to be doing as we're going, right? As we're doing life, we're supposed to be on mission uh, with Jesus. And so I want you guys to be praying about that and who that might be. Well, today we're going to hit our third week of Contagious Generosity. And we're talking about the feeding of the 5,000. I Many of you guys are familiar with this story. It's one of the cool ones that we see where, where God, I mean, Jesus does something really cool here. It's a miracle. And um, in our times, you know, we... You know, we have, maybe we have more people than we have food. We're like, hey, we need a fishes and loaves moment. You know, we, we need something like that. So Jesus feeds the 5,000. The apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all they had done and taught. I love that ministry tour. They've been out doing ministry, meeting the needs of others, right? And so they've been doing that. And so they come back with a good report to Jesus. And then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles uh, didn't even have time to eat. And so they were busy, and we're going to talk about that, uh, but they were busy doing ministry. So they left by boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. It didn't necessarily work out. But many people who recognized them and saw them leaving, and people from many towns ran ahead along the shore and got there ahead of them. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them. Remember last week we were talking about compassion? Remember the, the good Samaritan? He saw the guy that had been beaten, robbed, and he had what? He had compassion. He showed mercy. You know, and so here Jesus uh, steps out of the boat and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Late in the afternoon, his disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the nearby farms and villages and buy something to eat. But Jesus said, you feed them. With what, they asked. We'd have to work for months to earn enough money to buy food for all these people. Keep in mind, 5,000 just men. 5,000 just men is counted in this feeding. So how much bread do you have, he asked. Go and find out. Well, whatever happened. There we go. Go and find out. They came back and reported we have five loaves and bre of, of bread and, and two fish. I mean, we, we love that story. And if you read in the other Gospels, it's a little boy that had that, right? It's a little boy that had, had brought his lunch. He's the only one out of 5,000 men that planned well, right? You know, even the women didn't plan well. The women and the children, nobody else planned well. This one little guy did. So, I mean, he's probably owned some kind of business later in life. So then Jesus told the disciples to have the people sit down in groups on the green grass. And so they sat down in groups of 50 or 100. And Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish, and he looked up toward heaven, and he blessed them. So he took what was given, and he blessed it, right? 
Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. He also divided the fish for everyone to share. They all ate as much as they wanted. And afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftovers, of leftover bread and fish. A total of 5,000 men and their families were fed. I mean, that's unbelievable, right? You know, I mean, I mean you, you can give it up there. That's cool stuff, right? That's awesome. All right, but look at this. So meeting the needs of others can be taxing. So I want us to kind of go back to that first part of that. Because here's the thing, and we are always challenging, you know, our people and, and, and you know, to, to be ministers, to, uh, to be ministers to the people around you, meeting the needs of people around you. But here's the thing, it can be very taxing. And we know that, uh, you know, there's a reason that we see in Scripture the need for rest. And, you know, and I think that Jesus modeled for us a very good rhythm of, hey, when you're working, you work hard. And when you're resting, you rest hard. And when you're playing, you play hard, right? So there's a good rhythm in life. You know, and we can't work all the time. If you work all the time, you wear yourself out. And and the other thing is, is you wear out everybody around you. And so there has to be a good rhythm in our life to where we're resting, but man, we're working and then we're playing. I mean, all those things need to be in a good rhythm. And you can't do all, you know, just take one of those, hey, I'm going to do this all the time, then you're unhealthy. And so let's look back at what Jesus was doing here. Then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. And he said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. And I know that you guys have probably had situations like that where you're just going, 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 you don't have time to eat. But the thing is, is we, if we don't take the time to refresh and to refuel ourselves, we will become weary. And, you know, and the Bible even talks about when you're ministering to people, be careful that you're prepared be careful that, you know, that you're, you know, you're not putting yourself in a dangerous situation because we want to care for someone or reach out to them. But the thing is, we may not be ready for that. And if we're not rested up, we're not prepared, we, you know, we're not refueled, and we're not focused, we can try to do things in our own strength. And that always leads to failure. You know, and we've got to go, you know, God, I want it to be about you, and I want to be, I want to be fueled up by the Spirit. I want to make sure that I'm girded up with the Word of God, I, that I know what I'm saying. I'm not throwing my opinion out there. Your opinion is good, but it's really not worth a whole lot. The Word of God lasts forever, always accomplishes its task. It never returns void, right? And so the Word of God is what we need to be sharing with someone. And so there are times, maybe we need to spend time in God's Word before we start giving advice. You know, there's some things we have learned from life and experience, but we need to be careful about giving out just our opinion. And so ministry is meeting the needs of others with love. So ministry is saying, hey, it's not about me. It's about me ministering, me giving, me caring for those around me. And it's meeting the needs. And the needs could be just to listen. It may be that somebody needs to talk and how you minister to them is that you just listen to them. It may be that, you know, they need, you know, some help. Uh, Maybe they're digging a ditch and you say, man, I'll help you dig that ditch. You know, maybe it's to, you know, to to get, get something done, a task or whatever. You say, hey, listen, I'll help you do that. And so that's ministry is meeting the needs. They have a need in their life. You know, maybe they need someone to pray for them. You know, we have a prayer team every, every Sunday that's here at the front that they're here to pray for. They want to minister to you. You know, maybe it's someone that, hey, you do need advice. Maybe you need good counsel. You need someone to counsel you and give you wisdom and guidance. And so, you know, they're meeting that need in your life. That's ministry. Maybe, maybe it's to, to share with you what they have. Maybe, you know, they're hungry. They have a need and you have food and you say, you know what? I just want to minister to you. And, but here's the thing. You do it with love. You're not doing it begrudgingly. You're not doing it like, Dad, gum it, that's the last one I had, you know, whatever. But you're going, you know what, this is ministry. I want to meet the need, and I want to minister to these people. It's, I'll tell you this, kind of like financially. There are times we see people that have need. Well, it's not that you need to give them money. You need to teach them how to manage their money, right? And you need to help them understand, you know, how that works and how to balance a budget or whatever. So there's things that we need to do. But ministry is meeting the needs of others with love. So Jesus modeled taking time to rest. Again, there was a good rhythm there. He, he, Jesus modeled that. He would take time to rest. He would take time to go and pray. He made sure that he was prepared for the, for the taxing uh, job of ministry. And, and I'm just telling you, you know, I'm a pastor. I mean, I know what it's like. And, and there are times, man, I'm just weary. There are days I get home and I'm just exhausted. And I tell people this all the time, you know, growing up, my biggest fear in life was getting up in front of people. And I know it, maybe you don't believe that now, but it was. And I uh, grew up super shy and all that, you know. And, I, and so for me, whenever I get done teaching, I, you know, I'll teach twice on Sunday. I am exhausted because it's a spiritual drain. It is a physical drain. Not so much the physical, but it's an emotional and a relational. All those things are, you know, you're giving, you're pouring out. 
And, and so on Sundays, man, I always look forward to a Sunday afternoon nap, dude. I'm just telling you. That's the, that's the one thing I, that we go eat lunch, and then I'm ready to go home and take a nap. And it just, but I can work in the yard or I can hunt all day or whatever. And it, I'm not as tired as I am after a Sunday morning because I feel like there's, number one, there's a spiritual battle that's going on, right? And, and it's, so it's a taxing thing. But here's the thing. It's a, it's a giving. It's a pouring out. That's what we do. And so it's ministering. But Jesus modeled taking time to rest. You know, we, and we see it throughout the scriptures, throughout the gospels where he took time to rest. So we need our time to rest. Jesus cared about his disciples. I love this. He wanted to get the guys away for a time of refreshing. Hey, just a, a quiet place to be alone. He wanted them just to be able to get together. Hey, man, let's, let's, let's get together and just kind of spend some time alone. How many of you guys, now, some of us in here, we need alone time. You know, like, like uh, on Elf, like, Pop, I just need some alone time. You know, and so how many of you guys need alone time where you just need to recharge? Anybody in here? Yeah. Okay, some people are like that. Now, there's some of us in the room that we need to be around people to recharge. How many like that in here, that you need to be around people to recharge? Yeah, if you're a people person, you want to be around people. That's what recharges you. Like Laurie, you know, she, she likes, she goes, hey, I need some alone time. I need to be by myself. I need everything to be quiet. You know, and if everything's quiet, I'm like, all right, mm, I got to do something, man. I got to turn something on or whatever or some white noise or whatever. But the thing is, is we, we've got to figure out, hey, what get, brings rest to me? And we've got to be willing to make sure that we rest our bodies, we rest our minds, and we rest even in ministry. You're not to be giving out all the time. You get to the point where, hey, you know what, I need to be poured into so that I can pour into others. And so we've got to have that good rhythm, a healthy rhythm. Jesus is bigger than any problem we face. This was a big problem for these guys. This was a huge problem. I mean, and I know, you know, anybody in here have problems? Anybody in here face big problems in life? You know, you know if you haven't yet, you will. I can just tell you that. But uh, Jesus is bigger than any problem we face. It says, late in the afternoon, his disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. So in other words, there's no, you know, there's no Dollar General. Believe it or not, there was no Dollar General there. You know, they're everywhere, but there's not one here. So send the crowds away so they can go to the nearby farms and villages and buy something to eat. But Jesus said, you feed them. And their response is, with what? You know, we didn't, we didn't bring groceries. You know, we didn't bring a food truck. I mean, we didn't, we didn't come prepared for that. And they asked, you know, we'd have to work for months to earn enough money to buy food for all these people. They, they're saying, hey, listen, all of us, all of us would have to work for months. Think about that, months. We don't know how, how many months that might have been. But for months and months and months to have enough money to buy food for all these people. And so that's saying... Hey, listen, we would have to work for months and months just to have enough money to buy the food. That's not us keeping the money. That's not me only giving a portion. That's not me only giving a percentage. That's me having to work all these months just to get the money to be able to feed these people. That's the, uh, so that seemed insurmountable to them, right? I mean, these guys are going, Jesus, have you, have you seen the crowd? I mean, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of people here. What are we going to feed them with? With what? And, and so, Je I mean, Jesus is challenging them. But it seems insurmountable. And, and we've got to go, you know, you know, Jesus is bigger than my problems. He can handle my problems. And I promise you there are some of us in this room or maybe some of you that are watching online that you, you have something that you, you think seems insurmountable. And I don't know what it might be. Maybe it's financially something. Maybe you owe so much debt you think I'll never, ever pay it off. And I'm just telling you, there's some great ministries out there that, that deal with financial stuff. Like uh, Dave Ramsey does a really good job of helping people get financially debt-free. There's another one called I Once Was Broke and Now I'm Not. A friend of mine runs that ministry. And, and it helps you literally get to the point where you're not broke, but you have money. You have margin in life, right? And you can financially get to the point where you can pay your bills and you're not sweating it. Now, some of y'all are going, then that sounds awesome. But you know what, Mike? You don't know how much money I owe. I don't. God does. But here's the thing. He has a plan if you will stick to that plan. You just got to be willing to trust him. You got to be willing to move forward and you got to be willing to do the work. You got to be willing to work at it. You got to be willing to say no to some things. You can't just go buy anything and everything you want and really get to that point. You got to be willing to work that. And, and so, but Jesus, you know, he, he's telling them, hey man, you guys will do something. How we respond to our challenges in life reveals the level of our faith in Jesus. See, the disciples, they were around Jesus. They walked with him. But there were times, man, their, their faith was down here. And probably looking back, they felt like failures. Man, I don't know about you guys. Man, there are times I just feel like the biggest failure in the world, right? You feel like, hey, man, I'm a failure as a son sometimes. I'm a failure as a brother. I'm a failure as a dad. I'm a failure as a husband. 
I'm a failure as a pastor. You, we feel that way. But what I love is that God uses failures. I mean, he uses people that have failed. He's the God of second chances, right? Amen. And maybe there's some area of your life that you feel like the biggest failure in the world. But you go, you know what, God, here I am. If you'll just use me, I just want to be your vessel. I just want to be used by you. And, and, and that's the thing. If, if we will surrender whatever we have to him, I'm telling you, he will use you to make a difference in the lives of people. It just be, it's, it's just being willing to surrender. And so how we respond, you know, do we respond in faith? With God, all things are possible. We, you know, we, we say that, but do we believe that? So how we respond to the challenges, do we freak out? Do we go like, man, th there's no way that we can do this. Or do we go, you know what, with God, there's a way. With God, all things are possible. Do we really believe that? You know, no matter what you're facing, maybe it is a financial situation. You know, or maybe, maybe it's an addiction. Or maybe it's uh, cancer. Or whatever it might be, you go, you know what, man, whatever it is, my God is bigger than whatever that is. Maybe, it, maybe you feel like, hey, our marriage is so close to being over, there's no hope. But yet God says, there's hope. All things are possible, right? Maybe, no matter what it may be, you know, hey, you want to go to school at this place, and you go, hey, I'll, I'll never be able to afford that. God, God has a way of doing things, you know? And, you know and, and maybe God's calling you to do something. You know, I think about missionaries. We, Laura and I were talking with one of the missionaries that we support this past week. They're over in, uh, in Zambia, I think it is. And this is, it's the young couple, I don't know if y'all remember, they live in a tent. And they're, they're trying to get a house built. And, and there they are in Zambia, living in a tent, trying to, you know, build a house over there. And they're trying to raise support. And, uh, and, and they just seemed a little bit, you know, she seemed to, ve she was very vulnerable. She was really, you know, going like, you know, God, I know this is where you want us to be, but, you know, we need this, you know, and, and going, God, I need this. And she put it out in front of people. And so I love that about her. But here's the thing. It seemed insurmountable to her. Insurmountable. They're trying to build a house for like $40,000. And here, you know, you know, people drop $400,000 on a house, don't think nothing of it. But in Zambia, that's a big deal. And they're having to build most of it. But here's the thing is it seemed insurmountable to her. But the God that we serve can meet that need, right? He can meet that need. And, and so with God, all things are possible. We have to believe that. And so this is the question I want to throw out to all of us today. What, what are you facing that seems insurmountable? You know, jot, jot that down in the blank. Maybe you're going, hey, man, it's credit card debt. Or maybe it's business debt. Or maybe it's, hey, this relationship with my mom or my dad, it's insurmountable. This relationship with my child, it's insurmountable. You know, our marriage, making it, it seems insurmountable. Whatever it might be, I, I just want you to write that down and then, you know, begin to ask yourself, do I really believe what we just read? Do I really believe, you know, that with God all things are possible? Now, the, you know, here's the thing. We talked about it a while ago. There's rest, there's work, and there's play. Where well, you have to ask yourself, man, am I working to make sure that I'm doing my part? Because we all have a part to do. And if you're always sitting back hoping that somebody else does everything, then you will not get where you want to be. You've got to be willing to do your part. And so the disciples had a part even in what Jesus would do in the feeding of these, these 5,000 people. So Jesus asked us to bring what we have, whatever it is, to bring your biggest problem to Jesus, you know, bring your gifts to, to Jesus. And here's the thing, he just says, bring what you have. And so for the little boy who's got a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish, you know, think about that. He brought his gift. He brought his lunch. Jesus blessed it. But also the disciples come with, hey, we got a problem. We got all these people. We don't have food to feed them. So Jesus, you need to send them away. And Jesus, hey, you feed them. So no matter what we bring to him, Jesus can handle that, right? So he asked us to bring what we have. So they came back and reported, we have five loaves of bread and two fish. And then Jesus told the disciples to have the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of 50 or 100, and Jesus took the five loaves and he, the two fish, and he looked up toward heaven, and he blessed them. And so Jesus just, he, he takes what was given. He takes what we give. We're talking about generosity in this series, right? Contagious generosity. And I believe that, you know, like I said last week, if we will just trust him, and we will be willing to surrender some things and give some things, God's going to bless that. And you know what? Our kids will see that. Our family will see that. Our friends will see that. They may think we're crazy at some point, but they're going to see it and they go, man, man, he believes, he believes, you know, he put his faith in a, in a God who he believes really lives. And it may be that they go, you know what? I want that. I want to be there. And, we, and it becomes something that's contagious, right? 
And so what we, what we give, Jesus can bless and multiply. So what we give, whether it, you know, it's an offering that you give, it's your time. You know, we, uh, in my, my life group this past week, I asked, I said, hey, what's the most precious thing to you? And just about everybody in there agreed it was time. Now, some of it's the age in life they are. When you're younger, you don't have money, you have time, right? And so you're thinking, hey, man, I got time when you're younger, like a college student. But now, you know, at a certain point in life, you hit a point where it kind of reverses. and You go, hey, man, time is what's precious. And so whatever that we give, whatever we give, Jesus can bless and multiply. Jesus can bless our time. You know, and I, I, I think we believe that he can bless some fish and loaves, but we don't feel like he can bless our time. And he can multiply it. We all go, Mike, there's only 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week, and everybody's got the same amount. But how you manage that and how you use that, you know, if you do it in a way that honors God, I'm telling you, and you give some time to him, I'm telling you, God will somehow make it seem like, man, I've got more time to do, you know, the things I need to do than I ever did before. So we've got to be willing to trust him with even our time. So what we give, Jesus can bless and, and multiply. So God blesses us so that we can bless others. So how I'm blessed and what I'm blessed with is not just for me. I know sometimes we think, oh, this is for me, and I'm just going to hold on to it. And then what we do is we start holding on to as much as we can hold on to, and then we're afraid we're going to let something slip through our fingers. And what God is saying, hey, listen, I just want you to be that conduit. I want you to be that, that channel of blessing. And so God blesses us so that we can bless others. So we become a conduit of blessing. If you don't know what a conduit is, it's what, you know, like electrical wire runs through conduit. You know, and they'll run it all over the building or whatever. These lights, there's conduit everywhere. And, and so you could say, hey, listen, I want to be a vessel. I want to be a, you know, a way that God blesses others through me. And so, God, if you'll bless me, I'll bless others. Now, here's the thing. A lot of us will say, God, if you'll bless me, I'll bless others. And when it gets here, it's kind of like it gets stopped up. You know what I'm saying? It's all like all of a sudden, it's not a conduit anymore. You're thinking, hey, man, look at what I've got. And God says, hey, I'm blessing you so that you can bless others. I'm blessing you so that you can be a blessing in someone else's life. I'm blessing you so that you can tell them where it came from and that they can experience the same thing in their life. They see that, you know what, you're, you, have, you hold on with loose hands, with open hands, and you say, God, whatever you give me, God, I want to bless others with. And so we have that mentality. We, you know, and let me just say this. There's nothing wrong with owning things as long as they don't own you. But whenever you get to the point of where it's all about stuff and you getting stuff instead of you using that to be a blessing, you've missed it. And so we become a conduit of blessing. We become the hands and feet of Jesus. I love this part. I say this all the time, but you know, here it's very, it's a, it's a very clear picture that these guys became the hands and feet of Jesus, the disciples especially. So Jesus took the five loaves and two fish and he looked up toward heaven and he blessed them. And then breaking the loaves into pieces he kept giving the bread to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people he also divided the fish for everyone to share don't you love that i mean so jesus he blessed it he's breaking it and he's giving it to the guys and you're sitting there going like how did he do that you know it's a miracle there's no way to get around it so you got all these people you got five thousand spectators that are hungry you know how it is it's kind of like whenever you're in the you know you're grilling everybody's looking at the grill or if you're in the kitchen working on something you know to eat or whatever everybody's looking at it, like when's it going to be ready if you got boys that's the way it was right and so here's jesus with his food he's got five thousand men and their families probably looking like hey when's that fish gonna be ready you know and when's that bread gonna get here and so jesus gave them some order he gave some structure to it he said hey, have them sit down in groups and he begins to break it and it just multiplies and it just multiplies and it just multiplies and it can't be explained by man but it can be explained by god and god says hey listen i want to bless you and I, hey, I want to I want to meet the needs in your life. And so he begins to just pour it out. And so these guys are literally they become the hands and feet. They all ate as much as they wanted. And afterward, the disciples picked up twelve baskets of leftover bread and fish. So here, here's another thing. You know, I don't know about you guys, but as much as they wanted, you know. And so a lot of times I want more than I need. Does anybody anybody else wrestle with that? Like I like to eat. Anybody else in here like to eat a lot? You know. And so there are times that you know. We'll say, hey, your eyes are bigger than your stomach. You want more than you need. And so we will overeat. And that can be gluttony and that can be sin too. But what I'm saying is sometimes we wrestle with that. But this even says all that they wanted. And so they're eating to the point, man, they're full. And, and, and so Jesus said, hey, go around and pick up everything. Pick up 12 baskets of leftover bread and fish. And so, you know, hey, what was that? Were they going to make, make uh, take-home bags or what? You know, I don't know. But Jesus said, hey, we're not wasting anything. 
And so I love that when we have that mentality, hey, we're good stewards. We don't, we, we, we don't want to be wasteful. We've been blessed with stuff. We want to be good managers, good stewards, and we don't want to waste, we don't want to, uh, waste stuff. I, you know, I feel, like the, I feel like the dad around church here sometimes because I'm constantly going, hey, man, we left lights on. Any other dads in here like that? Because at the house, you know, that's part of the power bill, right? And, and so around here, I'm saying, hey, listen, do those lights need to be on? Can we turn those off? You know, because, you know, we have a big power bill here at the church. And so I want to make sure that, you know, that we're not wasting money that could be used for ministry, right? That's stewardship. That's what we're responsible for. And so I would rather, I would much rather be able to bless a missionary who's living in a tent in Africa than Alabama Power, just being straight up. You know what I'm saying? I would rather bless somebody than to bless them. And, and so we have to make sure that we're, we're good stewards of what we've been given. So what Jesus blesses us with can bless others. And some of y'all are probably thinking, well, Mike, I don't really have that much. I don't, I don't have much to give. And you're probably thinking financially right now. But see, God has blessed you with a personality, and God's blessed you with skills, and God's given you a spiritual gift if you're a believer. And so he's blessed you with time. He's blessed you with abilities. I've, I've got friends of mine that are mechanics that they'll start talking about how a, how a, a, a motor is put together and all the bearings and stuff in it. And I'm like, I don't have that skill set. You know, I watched a guy take a transmission apart one day and put it back together. And I'm going like, he is a genius, you know. I mean, I can't even understand the whole concept. And, and so there are some people that have just incredible gifts. And what we do sometimes is we play down what we can do. And we go, well, I don't have what he has or I don't have what she has. And we start belittling what God has blessed us with. And so maybe we, even whenever I said, hey, what Jesus blesses with can bless others, you're already going, well, I don't have much. You start poor mouthing. Anybody like being around poor mouthers? I do not. You know what I'm saying? I don't like being around poor mouths. I like somebody that says, hey, man, I just, this is all I've got. This is what I'm giving. You know what I'm saying? We just got to have that mentality. And, and so God, you know, show me how to use what you have blessed me with so I can build others up. And, and here, uh, again, here's a list of some of those skills. You know, some of you guys have incredible skills. You know, and, and maybe it's tech skills. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's building skills, carpentry. You know, there's a whole ministry called Carpenters for Christ that goes around and, and builds things and helps build things for churches and ministries. And it's somebody just using their skills. And so whatever that skill may be, spiritual gifts, whatever your spiritual gifts are, use them to help build up the body of Christ. You know, help be a greeter here. You know, be a teacher with our, our children or our students or something like that. But use your gifts. Don't just sit on them. Don't just come in here and sit in a chair and let that be it. And I would even say to our online crowd, don't let, hey, this is the only spiritual interaction I get. You have spiritual gifts. Use them to help build up the body of Christ. Wherever you are in the world, use them. And here's the thing, God is honored in that. And whenever we use those spiritual gifts, we help build up the body of Christ. We're furthering His kingdom. We're, we're making it about the Great Commission. And so our resources, maybe that's money, or maybe, maybe, it's, you know, maybe it's your time. But whatever it might be, say, God, I want you to use it. And God, I want to give it to you. Whatever I have, God, is yours. Use it. Instead of get, hey, saying, God, I'm going to give you a couple of hours on Sunday morning, you know, or I'll give you a, you, know, you know, a little bit of time maybe for a life group. But what if we say, God, everything I've got is yours. So if God, if I give it to you, I just want you to use it. And there are times, like I said, we, we want God to bless us. And we want to be able to tell everybody what we got, but we don't want to use it for his kingdom and for his purposes. You know, God gave you a job. And I think some of us think, hey, well, that job is to provide for my family. That's one part. But he gave you that job so that you could be a light in that dark world. He gave you that job so you could be a person of influence. He gave you that job so you could meet the needs of your family. But the thing is, he gave you that job so that you can literally make a difference for the kingdom of God. And so whatever we use, whether it's skills, spiritual gifts, resources, just saying, Jesus, I trust you to bless them. Are you using your blessings to bless others? That's a good question to ask. Just ask yourself, am I using my blessings to bless others? Am I using my spiritual gift? Everybody in the room, just ask yourself that, and you know if you are or not. Are you using your skills, whatever that skill may be? Are you using it to bless others? Are you using your resources? Are you using your time to be a blessing to others? Are you a conduit? Are you a channel of blessing? Are you a vessel that says, God, here I am, use me? And I'll just tell you this, if you do that, he will use you to do great and mighty things, life-changing things, eternal things. You know, in ministry, 
I don't know if you guys have figured this out yet, but the cool thing about ministry is when we, we give, we get more by giving than we get, do by receiving. If our heart's right. And then the other thing is, is whenever I get outside of myself and I ask God, God, you know, use me to meet someone else's needs. He meets my needs. He meets my needs. As I'm giving, as I'm pouring out, he pours into me. And he puts somebody in my life to pour into me. He puts somebody in my life to pray over me. And so if we'll just give, if we'll surrender, and I'm telling you, it can become contagious. But if we will do that, he will use us to do great and mighty things that have an eternal impact. Here's a couple of steps maybe for you to consider. I think the first one sometimes is to realize how blessed I am. Maybe just do inventory today. Maybe take the rest of the afternoon and you, you take a piece of paper and a pen and you, you start doing inventory of your life and you start writing down the blessings. Kind of like the old song, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and then you'll realize what God has done. But maybe you, put, you begin to write down your blessings and you say, you know, you know what, I had a warm bed to sleep in last night. We had food today. We had running water. We had heat. We had whatever it might be. We have transportation. I have a job. I have children. I have whatever it might be. You start listing them out. I have friends. I have a church. You know, whatever it is, you just begin to take inventory. You go, man, I am blessed. And God, I want you to use these blessings that you've given me to bless others. God, I want to be a channel of blessing. And so as we do inventory, God will begin to reveal that. Here's the next step, to trust you with what seems insurmountable. I don't know what you wrote in that blank while ago, but it, it, it probably seems like too big for you, and it probably is too big for you. But with Jesus, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. So no matter what it is that seems insurmountable, you can overcome that. God can say, hey, listen, that barrier does not stand in the way. Here's the last one. To choose. It's a choice and it's every day. And sometimes it's moment by moment. To choose to be a vessel that God would use. And just say, God, here I am. Use me. God, here I am. I surrender. God, use my voice, my, my words. Use my hands, my feet. Use me however you desire to use me to be a blessing to others. I want to ask you just to bow your heads and close your eyes. Maybe you're here today. Maybe you're watching online. And you've never received the greatest gift of all. And that is a relationship with God the Father through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ, and what Jesus did on the cross and what Jesus th did through the power of the resurrection. But maybe today you realize, you know what? That's me. That's what I need. I need Jesus in my life. My heart is hard. My heart is cold. I'm bitter. I'm angry. You know, I, I, don't, I don't see blessings. All I see is misery. And God wants to change the way you see yourself and the way you see life. Because here's the thing. Whenever Jesus steps into your life, he begins to change everything from the inside out. And it starts with our heart. And if you're watching online, maybe today you go, you know what, Jesus? I want to surrender my life to you. I want to give you everything. I want to give you not only what I have, but I want to give you the heart, my heart, my soul. I surrender. Maybe you're here in this room after your decision. And you just say, Jesus, will you come into my life? Will you, will you forgive me of my sins? My sins are many. So, Jesus, will you forgive me of my sins? His answer is yes. Jesus, will you come into my life and be my leader, be my Lord? His answer is yes. Jesus, I want to quit living the way I've been living. I want to live for you. That's repentance. That's brokenness over our sin. That's broken over the way we've been living. And just saying, Jesus, I come to you with all the faith that I have. Jesus, I come to you believing. I believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus, I believe in you. And so, Jesus... Will you come into my life? Will you be my leader? Will you be my Lord? Will you be my Savior? And his answer is yes. So if you just prayed that prayer, anybody in the room or anybody online, man, if you don't mind, let us know. If you're here in the room, just raise your hand and say, Mike, I just prayed that prayer with you. Anybody, just raise your hand and say, Mike, I prayed that prayer with you. Anybody. If you're watching online, do what you did last week. Man, just text my decision, 94,000. We would love to know. We celebrate like we did today. But I believe there's a lot of believers, a lot of Christians sitting in this room, a lot of people watching online, that you know Jesus as Savior, 
but I'm not sure he's really Lord sometimes. He's not in charge. We haven't surrendered all things to him. And maybe God is kind of dealing with you and stirring in your heart. You know what? There's some things you need to lay down, let go, and you need to surrender. And you need to use your spiritual gifts. You need to use your skills to be a channel of blessing. In just a minute, our worship team is going to come. They're going to lead us in a song of response. The prayer team will be here at the front to pray over you, to pray for you, pray with you, to minister to you. Maybe God's calling you to minister to someone this week, today. Maybe you just need to come down and say, hey, listen, I need you to pray for me. There's some people I need to minister to. I want to ask everybody to stand. Father, I thank you for loving us. God, I thank you for meeting with us today. God, I thank you that you, you still perform miracles. I thank you for the feeding of the 5,000. Lord, I pray that you would use us as your vessels and that we would surrender and we would give you everything. We would let go. We quit trying to hold on to everything, God. We would hold on with loose hands. The only thing we hold on too tightly is you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You respond as the Holy Spirit leads. Worship team.